first question that came in was from Terry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Terry wanted to know, can you explain how credit spreads are handled when they expire between the strike prices? Absolutely. One of the stocks that I'm in today, uh, I can take Calmain, for example. That's one that I'm in. Um, it was up a dollar today. A big one, of course, strange one, SWI Solar Winds. Uh, they got rumor of a third-party involvement. They're looking at, quote-unquote, what they call uh, strategy enhancements or strategy ideas. I think someone offered a tender buyout, so they're recruiting J.P. Morgan and someone else to help them with that. But they're up about six points today. They've been hovering around the 40 to $41 per share range for almost a couple of months now without much movement. Sure enough, they just pop up $6 today. So let's say we'll do two examples. So I have a drop, bigger drop today. No, I don't. Um, but for the moment, Let's take SWI, and let's say that I had been watching the stock for a while, hadn't shown any movement in the course of the last two months, so last week I decided to go ahead and sell the 45 call for today's expiration and buy the 50. So five-point spread on a stock that's just been trading around 41 or 42, and then this happened today at expiration. So the first thing I'm going to do, to, uh, Terry, to get some numbers here, let's go to SWI. And let's just go to the chain. And I'm going to go back a week in time. Oh, they don't offer weekly options. I apologize for that, but that's okay. We'll, we'll use this anyway. I'm going to go back to October, uh, let's say, 5th. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back to October 5th. SWI was trading at 41.34. Uh, at the time, we could have entered an October spread. Uh, it's not that great numbers. Maybe I should use CalMain. Let's use CalMain for this example. How about that? Let me go back one. We're going to type in CALM here. I just don't like these prices. As you can see, the 45 had no premium, a zero bid, and 35 ask. And then today, of course, it's two points in the money. But let's take a look at CalMain all over the map. Okay, let's use this as a reversal, Terry. CalMain at 5966. Uh, back on October 5th, about a week ago. Now, this doesn't offer weekly options either, but let's just say, for example, this was October 16th. Last week, or on October 5th, <clears throat> we did a bull put spread, and we thought the stock was going to stay above 57.50 or $55 per share, for example. So let's say we did a bull put credit spread, where we sold the 57 and a half. Okay, we'll do it that way. 57 and a half for 70 to 95 bid ask. Let's go ahead and say we got 80 cents for it. At the same time, we are going to buy. So we're selling at 57.50, but we're going to buy five points out, 52 and a half for about 15. All right, so a decent spread there. Didn't have a great probability, but let's say this was the position we entered. Let's go ahead now, and uh, I'm going to have to add our custom spread tool real quick to the position. Okay, and let's go ahead and take a look at what would have happened on CALM if today was today's expiration. Today was the expiration date, excuse me. And we had sold the 57 and a half put and bought the 52 and a half put. Okay, sell 80. This is the custom spread tool. Let's just keep one contract to keep it simple. We're going to buy at 15. So we're going to get a 65 cent net credit for a five point spread. It's a 14.9 percent yield. Okay, now on expiration, what was going to happen? Let's go fast forward to 1016. So this is for a bull put credit spread, Terry. What would happen in this situation if I made no adjustments? I didn't adjust the position when the stock reached within one to one and a half percent of my short put strike price. That's usually one of my triggers. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So that's usually when I would look to manage the spread. Since I sold the 57.50, I probably would have looked to close this position or adjust my short put, which is always the focus of your adjustments related to the stock price. And if it was a bear call, of course, we'd be looking at the short call. But if the stock reached to around $58 or 58.10, that's when I would look to manage this particular position. But we didn't. It broke against us. We hit expiration, and the stock is between the strike prices. What's going to happen? My long put expires worthless. I get no value out of the 52.50 put I bought. The stock's still above it. That expires worthless. In the case of a bull put credit spread, if I did nothing, the stock fell between my strike prices, then what is going to happen here is I'm going to be forced to essentially buy shares of stock at 57.50. Okay? 
Now, I could turn around on Monday and sell those shares of stock, but since it's not below both strike prices, I'm going to look at my account on Monday, and it's going to show that I own 100 shares of stock at 57.50, but I can subtract the 65 cent net credit from that. That would put us at a cost basis of roughly, what would that be, uh, 56.85. So we'd have 100 shares of CalMain at 56.85 that are now trading at 55.70. Just because you're in a spread position, it does not mitigate the obligation of a short put. If it's between the strike prices and you do nothing, you'll still be forced to buy shares of stock at the short put strike price. So in order to avoid that, you're going to have to buy to close your short put prior to expiration if you want to avoid assignment. Now, <clears throat> let's take just uh, very quickly here, let's take a reverse concept of this. Uh, let's say that at one point this couple weeks ago, after CalMain's uh, disastrous earnings, the stock dropped down about $51 per share. Four days later, it was back up to $59. But let's say we did a bear call spread in this scenario, where a couple weeks ago we had gone ahead and sold the 55 call because we thought the stock was going to stay below $55 per share, and at the same time we bought the 60. And let's keep about the same numbers. Oops, sorry, folks. So we're going to sell the 55 call, and let's say we got 80 cents for it when the stock was trading at around $52 per share, and we bought the 60 for around 15 cents. Okay, let's go ahead and run that. Now, the stock's a little bit above my short uh, call strike price. Maybe I should have used the 52 and a half, 57 and a half, but that's okay. So in this case, with the stock trading above my short call strike price, if we were at expiration, the short call obligates me to deliver shares of stock I don't own if it ends up in the money. So in this case, if I left this alone through expiration, I didn't adjust the uh, 55 strike call. Now that it's in the money, I have an obligation to deliver 55 uh, shares of stock at $55. What would end up happening when I checked my account on Monday is I'd see that I'm short essentially shares of stock at 55. Now, some brokers might handle this differently if you're not allowed to be short stock in your account. They may buy shares of stock for you at the market price of 55.70, deliver them at 55 to cover the obligation. But in most cases, I've seen you end up short shares of stock with a bear call spread because it's the obligation of just a short call, a naked call by itself. Now, if, of course, the stock had gapped above both strike prices, Terry, in this case, you have an obligation on the bear call spread to deliver shares of stock at 55 you bought the right to buy shares of stock at 60. So your broker would automatically buy shares of stock for you at 60, sell them at 55. You'd have the five-point loss, the difference in strike prices, the maximum loss on the spread. We keep the 65-cent net credit, so you'd have a full loss, in this case, of $4.35. Okay? So that's the scenario if it's above both. But if it's between, you have to fulfill the obligation of the short call or the short put. Um, the same thing is true in the debit spread as well, okay? So if in a debit spread, you still have a short option, you still have a long option as well. Okay, I'm just going through. Okay, good. So we have three other questions that have come in, but they're all not related to this. So I just wanted to make sure that we covered that as well, okay? So I was just scrolling through to see if we had any other questions related to the spread management. But those are your, whenever you enter a spread, whether it's a credit spread, bear call credit, excuse me, or a bull put, credit spread. Remember that if it's between the strike prices, you still have to fulfill this obligation, the short call obligation or the short put. It's almost like a naked call or naked put at that time. It just didn't exceed the long call. So in this bear call, I'd be forced essentially to deliver shares of stock I don't own at 55. I'd end up being short shares of stock. Um, the 60 call would expire worthless. It's out of the money still, so that one still expires worthless. Gives us no value back. All right. So that's how that goes. Now, other topics on that, <clears throat> I'm going to go to the free webinars link very quickly, Terry. I'm going to send everyone this quick link, www.poweropt.com slash webinars.asp. This is a public page. You don't need to be logged on to a Power Options uh, subscription or trial account. And the reason I want to go here is underneath the archive, if you go to the options strategies, there's a webinar here from November 2014, Managing Your Spread Positions. It talks about the five or six ways that I look to manage credit spreads and debit spreads and the trigger points I use um, based on maybe option premium. 
from the original net credit I received or maybe from um, range of the stock price or a switch over in um, I apologize uh, switch over in simple moving averages for example okay so let's get to our other questions there so I just want to make sure there's that and there's a quicker one too a couple weeks ago during one of our Friday presentation actually a couple months ago on May 20th 2015 the requested topics uh, this conversation here five ways to manage your credit spreads the first 45 minutes we kind of spent just reviewing those five ways to manage a credit spread all right Jim is that Jim was the next question yeah, how do I find good options trades spreads or single options I don't want to buy the stock okay Jim well that's what our tools are designed to do when you're talking about a specific spread or single options I don't know if you mean buying options Jim or selling options but you can use these tools to identify what would be considered a good position. Earlier uh, this week, we talked about using the search tool for bull put credit spreads. Uh, we focused on bull put credit spreads. That was our highest uh, answer from our poll. But if I go to bull put and I go to search, a system's going to pull up and pull up a list of trades that match a default criteria. These are not recommendations or suggestions, Jim. But if I scroll down below the list of trades. I can go ahead and set the criteria any way I want to, okay, to match what I'm looking for. Now, what do you consider a good bull put credit spread is probably different from what another investor would consider as a bull put credit spread, meaning not everyone, um, <clears throat> uh, not everyone is going to have the uh, same requirements. Okay, some might look for uh, highest. Uh, of values and some are going to look at um, highest premium some are going to look at highest probability I'll review quickly what I did for bull put credit spreads um, and I'll talk about what I'm looking for so we saw earlier let me go back one step just to the bull put credit spread home and this kind of relates to Bill's question as well um, Bill came in with a question uh, is there any reason to buy to close or sell to codes sell to close spreads which are all out of the money. Um, maybe this isn't related to that directly, so I'll get to Bill's question. Bill had a follow-up to that, so don't, never mind, but I know what you're talking about, Bill. I'll describe that in a second. All right, backtrack one more time. A bull put credit spread. What I'm looking to do here is I'm selling a put, which does obligate me to deliver shares of stock. But instead of leaving this as a naked put, where I might have to put up the full cash to cover the short option criteria, I'm buying a deeper out of the money put my margin becomes the difference in the strike prices. So if I sold a 50 strike put, one contract, instead of putting up $5,000 as a naked put, if I buy the 45 put as well, I still receive a credit, but now I need to only put up $500 to cover the difference in the strike prices instead of the $5,000, and we still take in a good credit. The idea is for the stock to stay above both put strike prices so that both puts expire worthless and you keep the net credit. But even if I was in a naked put transaction, I'd want the same thing. In other words, if I just did a naked put and didn't have this option here and the profit and loss chart continue down here, same risk reward profile as a covered call, for example, but you said you didn't want to buy stock. I'm just pointing this out. But with a cash secured naked put, <clears throat> I want the same thing. I typically want the stock to stay above the put strike price so the put expires worthless and I keep the net credit. But if the stock falls a little bit, I might be okay because now I get the stock at a discount, but you said you didn't want to own stock. Now, you should only do a naked put strategy if you wouldn't mind owning the stock because remember, that's the possibility of the outcome here. One is it expires worthless. Two is that you own stock. Yes, you can manage it at any time, but you always want to remember your rights and obligations before doing anything. Okay, now all that being said, what are some of the basic criteria investors use to look at when trading a bull put spread? Well, before we even get into the options criteria, it's called a bull put spread. So I probably want to look for a stock that has bullish criteria. What are some things that we could use? Well, I might want to look for a stock with a good average stock volume to show decent liquidity. I might want to only look at mid to large cap stocks. I might want to look for stocks that have shown good earnings per share growth. So they've shown growth in earnings, good management and reflection of a good product, and maybe a relative PE ratio, but I also want to see a stock that's trading in an uptrend. Now, you may have a criteria where you just want to look for credit spreads or debit spreads that are shorter term. With the advent of the weekly options, you might only want to look 7 to 10 days out in time. Or you might want to go 15 to 20 days out in time. That's all fine. So how are you going to identify positions? Very simple. You select the strategy as we just did. We selected bull puts. 
I'm going to go into search, and once I'm in the search tool, I'm going to hit clear filters. There's four different categories of options, or stock and options criteria you can enter, the technicals and fundamentals and options. I'm going to start with the stock criteria. I don't have any stock price restriction because I'm probably just setting up a five or 10 point spread. It doesn't matter if it's price line at $1,600 or if it's uh, Micron technology at $1,850, okay? But I had mentioned I want to see stocks that share good growth, so I might put in an earnings per share growth of at least 5% or more. Keep my PE ratio at a relative range, zero to 70, zero to 50. And I mentioned too that I was gonna look for maybe just mid cap or larger. So we see here, we hover over the uh, filter. It gives us a description of how this is measured and what criteria we'd wanna enter. So for mid cap, since it's measured in millions, I'm gonna look for greater than 2000 market cap here, okay? When you're doing credit spreads, debit spreads, covered calls, naked puts, any other strategy, I highly recommend that you check the box here for earnings date, not between now and expiration. You also want to verify that with maybe uh, information at your broker before you enter a trade. There's no point in entering a credit spread if you've got earnings coming up because if there's a sudden gap down or a sudden gap up, what looked like a profitable position with only two days to go can suddenly go to maximum loss with any type of gap. Talked about some technicals here. What would I use? Maybe a good average stock volume, 750,000 shares per day. This is measured in thousands. So check the pop-up there. And I'd mentioned I'm going to look for stocks trading in an uptrend. So here, under the technicals, I can use simple moving average. If you use MACD, you can also use that as well, or Bollinger Bands. We're just going to put in a simple one here, stock to be greater than the SMA 20. Now, what do you know about options criteria? Well, I probably don't want to be more than 60 days out in time when doing any credit spread. I may want to be at least more than four or five days out in time to get a decent premium. So my days to expiration, let's just go about five to 20. Okay, so that'll show us any weekly options and the standard expiration for next week. You're gonna have trading goals. What is the minimum net credit you're looking for in a spread position? Let's say mine is 35 cents. So I'll put that in the net credit. Strike difference, this is entirely up to you again, sort of a personal preference. But if you only wanted to trade spreads that had a five point spread or less, well, I'll just set my strike difference here to less than or equal to five. Very quick, of course. Then a range out of the money. Remember the bull put, we want it to expire above the strike prices. Now you may be very bullish on a position, on an underlying stock that's trading at 55. But if you sell the 55 put by the 50, you really got a 50% probability of getting the maximum return. Your return will be higher because the option you're selling is at the money and has the most premium, the most time premium that is. But in general, you're gonna wanna go a little bit out of the money, maybe greater than three to 5%. And for spreads, we wanna focus on the probability. I'm gonna start with the probability, theoretical probability of 75% or higher that the stock will end up trading above my short put strike price. Lastly, I'm gonna put in some basic liquidity. I wanted to see options that trade at least 10 contracts today had an open interest of at least 100. But again, this is all up to you to set what criteria you want. But these are some good stock criteria to use. Let me go ahead and submit that. Wow, there are only two positions that expire next week, October 16th, nothing on the 23rd of October that matches the stock criteria I wanted does not have earnings between now and expiration, has the minimum net credit and return I'm looking for, and that's EW, 140 to 135, and TAP, uh, Molson Coors Brewing at 77 and a half, 72 and a half. These are not recommendations or suggestions, this is just a general idea. In any strategy, <clears throat> excuse me, Jim, in any strategy, if you didn't want to go directly to the search and put in your own filters, you can go into the sample searches field up here at the top, one of the available tools, and you see here that we have themed searches for every strategy set up for you. Here's one on looking at bull put credit spreads on the broad-based ETFs. Here's one on a five-star stock rating, uh, only those stocks that are rated five-star by Standard & Poor's and safety first. So that's just a quick review of what settings you use. By the way, those, those stock criteria I just entered uh, earnings per share growth greater than five, mid to large cap stocks, P of zero to 70, avoiding earnings between now and expiration, um, looking for stock trading in an uptrend, and I may even use uh, the MACD. That's the same underlying stock criteria I'd use for essentially any bullish strategy. Naked puts, bull put credits, 
standard long collars, maybe even married puts, um, covered calls, bull call debit spreads. I'd use the same underlying technical criteria, but then I'd adjust the options criteria based on the strategy as well. Okay, and then um, one last thing here. Again, Jim, some of the things that might benefit you. You wanted to talk about how can you find new positions in certain strategies. Well, there's various webinars here on, uh, let's see here, let me go down. Searching for covered calls, find the best bull put credit spread. I know it's two years old, but the uh, concepts are the same. Introduction of power options, long call and long uh, put. That's helping you with the search. But concepts of what you'd want to look for, go into the option strategies tab under the free webinars page. Um, here's selection criteria for buying options. The ins and outs for buying a call option or buying a put option based on our experience. Introduction to naked puts, talking about what criteria I might use to identify a naked put position. And then, of course, we get into vertical spreads and, uh, you know, managing some of the spread positions, but really what is the vertical spread there? So there's various webinars that will help you with setting up the search and criteria. Once again, in the requested topics, some of the other ones here, um, management, I thought saw one a little while ago, but uh, bull put management, I think, is what I was looking for. But yeah, under the option strategies, and even in that Power Options Tools pod, you'll see a lot of information on what criteria we use. That being said, if you're wondering why are, when you go into a strategy and you click on search, where did these criteria come from? So if I went into Covered Call right now, and I click on search, you see one that says Broker and Advisor Recommended. If you're just starting a trial, you see the other ones, initial values, at the money, in the money, out of the money, and so forth. Well, these are kind of themed searches as well, the default criteria that's listed. This criteria, the broker and advisor, the initial values at the money, and the in the money and out of the money, this is the basic criteria that Ernie and I would start off with if we were looking for a covered call position. I'd probably start with broker and advisor recommended, but I would change this criteria. I would change maybe the time frame. Instead of going out to November, I might look at all months and shorter term. I might look for a higher downside protection. Uh, I might look for a little bit more volume and open interest. But notice, you know, stock recommendation, average broker recommendation to vote buy or strong buy, stock in an uptrend, but I might want to add some other things, so the simple moving average, um, average stock volume. You can customize it any way you want to match what you want to see. Use those default searches as a stepping stone to create your own personal search. This all relates to Francisco. Francisco says, what is the best criteria you think in doing a naked put option strategy? There's not one criteria that's the best, Francisco. Okay, that everything works hand in hand and in combination. When I sell a naked put, I want to be a little bit out of the money. I still want to get maybe a one to one and a half percent yield for a 25 to 30 day trade. But I think I already said what the most important criteria is to me. And the most important criteria is I'm never selling a naked put on a stock that I would not want to own. If I come up with an idea for a naked put from the search and I look at the stock chart and the company information, the news, and just related to what's been going on, the earnings have been poor recently, there's some expectations of poor performance going forward. If it's not a stock that I wouldn't want to own long term, I don't care what the put premium is and what the probability is, I'm not entering that position. I would use the same criteria for a naked put that you would use to buy shares of stock. Even though the naked put is considered a shorter term trade, you might even be doing naked puts weekly options, Francisco, use the same criteria you would to buy a stock. And then make sure that the premium you're getting for the naked put over the time frame matches your goals and your expectations. Um, as again, to me, one of the most important things for this position is the underlying security. If the underlying security is not going in the direction I want, is not trading in an uptrend, does not have the fundamentals I want, to me it's not a good candidate for a naked put. I, I don't care what the premium is, it's not a good candidate. So I want it to match my stock criteria first, but then I want to make sure that I'm the range out of the money have maybe the probability I want as well. And ask yourself first, Francisco, before doing that, are you creating a naked put or trading multiple naked puts in your portfolio to potentially buy shares of stock at a discount? Or are you hoping to have as many of those puts as possible expire worthless? If you want as many as possible to expire worthless, you're going to want to put in the yield that you want to match your trading goals for whatever time frame you select and have a reasonable out of the money 
but focus on the probability. You're probably going to want a probability of 75 or higher, just like you would in a bull put credit spread. If you're looking longer term to potentially get into shares of stock at a discount, where you might actually convert it to a covered call after you put the stock, then you might want to look for a lower probability because you might want the better premium. And if you only have a 65% probability, but you're getting a dollar, as opposed to the 75% probability, we're only taking in 40 cents. Well, that might be okay if you wouldn't mind owning the stock long term. So develop your trading plan first and decide, are you doing this to get into shares of stock? Or are you doing it just to have multiple puts expire worthless as much as possible? Okay, Ken asks, if I have a married put account and the stock drops a large amount, what are their criteria for rolling down the in-the-money put? Well, in the blueprint, we talk about the SEGA model for every each one of the 12 different income methods, okay? And with the 12 different income methods, what I mean by the SEGA model is that's our decision-making process. So if a stock falls 10 or 15 percent or even 3 or 4 percent, before I decide to apply income method number nine, I have to ask myself, do I think the stock's going to recover? If I don't think the stock's going to recover, even if I still have four or five months to go, but I don't think the stock's going to recover in that time, I'm more likely to just exit out of the position, even though the stock's down 15%, I'll take my 2 or 3% loss and be happy. Okay? Because there's no point in using income method number nine, rolling the put down to increase the risk to 7 8% if you don't think the stock's going to recover. Okay, so you'd only do that if you think the stock's going to recover. When is the first time you might want to look at it? If you think it's just market related and not due to weakness in the stock, or you maybe you just missed something on the stock and it's continuing to go down, usually when it drops about three to five percent or a full strike price from where you got in, that's when I'd look. For example, I bought stock at 50. I bought a 55 put three weeks ago for eight dollars. So I've got three dollars at risk, which comes out to about 5.3%. If my stock, you know, I got into the stock when it was at 50, it's now trading at 55. If the stock drops down to 46 or so, almost a, a full strike of just five points, I might consider then selling the 55 and buying the 50, if and only if I think the stock is going to recover and the pullback is just due to market weakness. And that's shown as you're tracking the positions, because those potential adjustments that we're talking about here for rolling the put down will only appear if the stock has dropped, I think, about five, 4 or 5% from when he originally opened the trade. Um, I had this question earlier. Bill's question uh, came in. He says, is there any reason to buy to close, sell to close spreads, which are all out of the money? And they said later on, oh, never mind. They're always out of the money. Well, in that sense, I had a discussion with a, a coaching session earlier this morning with a uh, Power Option subscriber and his wife, and they were looking at a bull called debit spread. And they had sold the 57 call and bought the 52. I'm not going to remember the stock, unfortunately. But let's go into the custom spread tool here. I don't know. It was the first session at 10 o'clock this morning. So I'm just going to use Starbucks. It's at 60. And so let's say that for next week we had sold, not very similar. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry, folks. We'd sold the 57 and a half call. And let's say we bought the 55 call. Uh, it doesn't matter. And but we had what were their prices? It was selling that at six sixty. Or was it six even? Six even. And buying oh no, no, it was a five point spread. I'm sorry. Yeah, I have to use a five point spread. No problem. Could use any numbers really, but let's just use the five point spread there. I'm gonna add the fifty call in. Alright, so we sold that at sixty. We bought strike that, reverse it. But Wow. Okay. Let's try this again. We're going to buy the 52 and a half call at $6. We're going to sell 57 and a half at 380, I think it was. Oh, that's way too high. Yeah, that's way too high. I'm sorry, folks. 280. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so this was their spread, and it's now in the money. But since they just opened it a few days ago, they couldn't close the position for a profit. And they said, I thought I could close the position at any time if it was in the money. Or if this was a bull put, you know, I thought the we could close the position for a profit if it was above the break even at any time. No. Because it's a spread, you have to wait to get close to expiration, of course, even if it's above the money, for the time value to drop down. As a general rule, 
what most investors will apply is sometimes the 80-20 rule. So if I entered a bull put credit spread and I originally received a dollar of net credit, and then going forward, if I still have seven or eight days left, but I can liquidate the position by buying to close my 57 and a half and selling to close my 52 and a half and only pay 20 cents, I kept 80% of what I expected to make, so I may close the position early. However, if I just open the trade today and the stock moved up a point and I'm above my break even, and I still have 15 to 20 days to go, I have to hold on that position longer for the time value to decay out of both options before I can get closer to that maximum gain and close it for that 80% or higher, okay? So do you want to close a spread early? Yeah, I mean, if I can close a spread and take 80 to 90% of what I expected to make 14 days early, I may go ahead and close that position, okay? Um, but sometimes if I'm within two to three days and it suddenly hits that 80% mark, I just leave it open for the two to three days, take the full profit. Let's see, Matthew is being patient. He just had a quick question. Can you do the API with choice trade? Unfortunately, no. I don't have a link to uh, choice trade through the broker link, for example. Right now, the broker link only goes to uh, Options Express and what was formerly Brokers Express, so just Options Express right now. So I don't have an API interface available with choice trade, but I can talk to the programmers about it and see if we can get in a discussion with them. Okay, yeah. Okay, all right, so. Scott wants to know Okay, hold on one second here. I'm sorry. Uh, Jim was, Scott, I'll get to your question in a minute. Jim says he's uh, bull puts on PCLN, Google, and Baidu. Good. For right now, I just want to make sure that you don't leave those open for uh, earnings as well. You want to avoid that. Huh. Real quick. Um, oh, sorry. Real, real quick. Oh, Jim also asked, can you set a minimum number for open interest? Absolutely. If you want to set a minimum number of 1,000 contracts or 10,000 contracts, uh, that's absolutely there as well. Richard asked, earnings release for Netflix on 10-14, um, October monthly options, the 16th, debit or credit iron condors? Uh, Richard, I wouldn't do either, honestly. When you're talking about earnings on a particular stock, you're expecting the stock to move one direction or the other. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, let's, let's stay here. You're expecting that the stock is going to move one direction or the other, that there's going to be a bounce. If you did an iron condor or even a credit or a debit spread, let's go to the 16th. Netflix is at 113. Very quickly, I'm going to select some options here. There we go. So what I might do is a uh, good premium, of course. These things are drastically overinflated. So even if I went to the 105, 100, and let's say the 120, 125, it's a four-legged spread. So I'm going to sell the 105 put by the 100, sell the closer to at the money 125 call, and buy the deeper out of, no, sell the 120 call, buy the deeper out of the money 125, okay. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so the premiums are heavily enriched. So what did I do? This is an iron condor. This is not what I want for an earnings. I mean, if earnings are coming out, it's, you're expecting to earnings to disappoint and see a 20% drop or 10% drop. Well, that would be 13, 11 points to maybe 20 points, which would break through our 105 strike. And if you expect earnings to be positive and you expected a 10% gain or more, or maybe even a 20% gain, it's going to break through your 120 strike. You need the stock to stay between these two values to make the full profit. Sure, you're not at upper lower break even yet. But this isn't the position you want. You probably would want to enter into a long straddle or long strangle, by the way, which would give us a position, a profit and loss, where I'd buy an out-of-the-money call and buy an out-of-the-money put, which would give us that profit and loss chart without this up here. So if the stock collapses, we have the potential to make money and the stock moves up. But just looking at the premiums here, they're already too inflated. You're looking at it in the sense of these are really inflated premiums so you want to take advantage of that, but if you do a directional trade like an iron condor and there's a gap down or a gap up, you're going to lose money. And at the same time, will you experience a volatility crush? Will it be cheaper to buy back the options? Well, sure. Once the earnings come out, the volatility crush will occur. These will not be inflated, so you might be able to buy them back. But that's irrelevant to the stock moon. If the stock drops down to $98 per share and gaps down, you're going to have a loss because your break even is at 102. 
and the stock goes above 122, you're going to have a loss. That's nah, 123 technically. Even if the premiums are cheaper to buy back because of the volatility crush, it doesn't matter. The mathematics are already in place. Your break even is here and here, regardless of the volatility crush for next week. Okay. So, I mean, are you comfortable that the stock might be trading within this range, say between 122 and uh, 106? No, I'm sorry, 104. We'd still realize a profit. Then maybe you do that. But if you're playing in earnings, you're probably flipping this upside down by buying a call and buying a put to do a long straddle or a long strangle. But because of the premiums are inflated, really sorry folks, allergies. <laughs> because the premiums are inflated, let's say I did a deep out of the money one and I bought the 100 put and I bought the 125 call, way out of the money but still expensive, my break evens are gonna be in the 90s to the 130s. So that's more of the thing you'd expect, but this is huge break even, that's a 20 point drop or a 20 point gain. So you say, okay, well, we got to be better. If it's at 113, why don't I just buy the 110 and maybe the 120? All right, well, let's take a look at that. Let's go ahead and buy the 110 put and buy the 120 call. We'll just use natural bid and ask here. We're going to buy one apiece for a long strangle when they're different strike prices. Still break even to 98 and to 131. That's because the volatility is already priced in. Usually what you want to do to play earnings is you want to get into the position prior to about three to four weeks before the earnings, before the volatility kicks in. See, if I had bought these two options, the October 16th options on Netflix, maybe even if the stock was hovering around 113, but a month and a half ago, the volatility would have been much lower. I might be able to close the position today to realize a profit. Let's take a look at that real quick. October 16th expiration, the 110 put on Netflix and the 120 call. I don't even know where the stock is going to be at this time, but let's go back somewhere into end of August, beginning of September. Let's go to the chain, Netflix. Let's select our date. I'm going to go back to August. Let's go to the end of August. So let's say the 28th. Why not? Okay, let's look at our October 16 series. Netflix is a 117, so it's not that far away. The 110 put is priced at $8. I don't think we're going to be anywhere near a profit. And the 120 was, pr oh, no, we don't want to use August 28th, do we? I apologize. Let's go to September. We wouldn't have bought into calls. We could have gone direction. We would have bought in calls in the, right after this. Remember October excuse me, August 21st to August 24th, that massive decline in the market. The volatility was way too high at that point. Let's go forward to September 16th. Still about the same. We would have paid, oh no, the stock's really far down. It's at 104. So anyway, let's go to October. Let's go to medium chain. All right, so we're going to buy the 100 put, much better, at 660. And we're going to buy the 120 call uh, to, let's call it $3 even, okay? So, a few weeks ago, September 16th, about a month ago, the 100, I'm sorry, the, oh, no, I'm off. I apologize. The 110 put we are going to buy is 11.80. Bummer. Okay, still a lot of volatility in the market. And then the 120 call was at $3, okay? So we would have had an investment of 14.80 had we done that. Now, we're not at earnings yet. Let's go back to the custom spread tool here. And so we had a cost basis of 1480. If we bought the two today, it'd be a 640, so it would only be about 1150. So I'm sorry, it is a little bit cheaper. The volatility had been priced in before then, so it wouldn't have done us much good. But now, we still need a wide move one direction or the other. Okay? All right. Now, I just, uh, yeah, depending on what your outlook is, doing a debit spread or credit spread, you're betting one direction or the other and not a large gap. The iron condor is a neutral position. Even though the premiums look great and you're trying to do a credit spread to take advantage of the high premiums, if you're right, that'll work out great. But if you're wrong, you're going to still have, even with the great premiums, close to a 5 to 1 to 10 to 1 risk reward ratio on a in-the-money debit spread or an out-of-the-money credit spread. Okay, Scott says, how do you best determine the direction of the stock? Okay, well, 
there are several factors. Um, things that I use, we've already talked about. All right, so if I'm looking for a stock, I'm going to use some of the technical filters and the fundamental filters. But really, I'm going to use the technical filters. I'll look for stocks that are trading in an uptrend. I also might use the MACD. And Ernie and I both use Bollinger Bands for time to time as well. Okay, so we're looking for positions there that we would, um, you know, using the Bollinger Band ranges um, and using the MACD. Is the MACD a lagging indicator? Sure. Is the Bollinger Band maybe considered a lagging indicator? Absolutely. But if I'm doing bullish positions, I want to look for stocks that are, you know, above their 20-day or 50-day moving average. I want to look for stocks where the MACD has just maybe crossed over the signal line or has been above the signal line for a few days, showing strength. I don't particularly use RSI, but I know a lot of investors do. It's also kind of a lagging indicator. And uh, with the Bollinger Bands, you know, the Bollinger Band and the Bollinger Band ranges, you're looking for stocks that are trading up near the upper range of their Bollinger Band or near the lower range as well. And that's what we're looking for for direction. But the key is, and uh, what, what I wanted to tell you, Scott, here is um, I'm going to want to uh, go back to the webinars page. I'm sorry. In the option strategies, you're going to want to review this webinar for selection criteria for long options. Um, the ins and outs of buying a call option or a put option, the stock technical and fundamental criteria for call or put buying. But that's the same thing we'd probably use call buying, bullish stock positions, bullish options positions, excuse me, um, put buying, bearer stock positions, bear call, credit spreads, married calls, short callers, anything that's bearish, and be the same type of criteria that we're generally looking for and related to the stock, okay? We do discuss some option criteria in that too for buying calls and buying puts, but it focuses on most of the stock criteria as well, okay? And even discussion on some of the Greeks and the technical indicators what is the Bollinger Band? What is the simple moving average? I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to brush you off, Scott, at all, but you're going to get much more benefit out of watching this webinar than me trying to force this 40 to 50 minute presentation that's here from August 5th into 5 to 10 minutes here <laughs> to allocate to the discussion on which criteria to use. We already discussed some of the bullish criteria when we talked about the bull put credit spread. Same bullish criteria to use for a naked put, uh, bull put credit spreads, and so forth. Um, and then for the bearish position, I'm going to look for stocks in a downtrend, maybe have weaker volume um, as well. There's no one indicator that dictates the stock is going to go up and go down. Okay, And the stock criteria that might have worked for an investor six months ago might not work six months in the future. So when you're opening a position, whether you're bullish or bearish, whether you've set your criteria to what you want or you're using a different criteria for a bullish or bearish position, any position you're opening, remember risk management and proper position sizing is really the most important thing. This also relates to what Francisco asked earlier. One of the other most important things for a naked put criteria that I'm using, in addition to I wouldn't uh, ever sell a naked put on a stock I would not want to own, is that I want to make sure that what I'm selling is not putting too much of my portfolio at risk. You know, not all of your eggs in one basket. I don't want to enter a spread that has a 10 or 15 to 1 risk reward ratio and put 50% of my trading capital into that one bull put spread. That's not enough. Each spread should probably only represent 2 to 3% at most of your entire portfolio value. So if it goes against you from any unexpected reason, then you can take that 2 to 3% loss your entire portfolio and still be okay to keep trading. All right, a spread trade should never represent probably more than 10% of your total portfolio at risk. It should never be that high. You want to keep it into single digits. Um, oh, and I, I did accidentally, Bill had another question. He came in later. He says, what I meant, any reason to sell if they're both basically worthless just before expiration? It depends on the time frame, and we talked about that, Bill. If I still have seven to 10, seven to 10 days to go to expiration on my bull put credit spread, and I can get out with an 80 or 90% profit, I'll take that. If I'm two days, three days away, yeah, I'll leave it open and let it go, okay? <clears throat> Jim's, Jim had thrown in a mention, I like to scale out of profitable positions. Yeah, I do do that too with doing uh, maybe long calls or long puts. So I bought maybe five or ten calls on a position. It went up um, as I expected, and I had ten contracts, so maybe I might sell five of them and leave the other five open. Helps cut down my cost basis, helps pay for that as well. 
Um, Jim's follow-up question, are there any seasonal projections in the platform, uh, like uh, another software? No, we don't do that. Um, uh, we, we don't show projections. The tool that we have that I use to time my trades and manage my trades is the market sentiment tool. What this tool does is it takes 13 broad-based indicators, uh, total market put call volume ratio, the number of days the SPX has been up, a number of days a gap above the 20-day moving average, percentage of stocks above the SMA 20, the volatility index, and, and so much more. A lot of related to the SPY. Uh, different trends. What Ernie did is he looked historically, and based on these 13 indicators, you know, he looked historically and said, okay, based on the uh, histogram ranges, so if I go to details here, here's the total distribution over the last seven to eight years of the percentage of stocks that are above their 20-day moving average. And so as you can see, once you get up to about the 81% range, or the especially the 88% range, it rarely goes higher than that. What this is showing is the percentage of times of the last seven years that it's been at 83, for example. Only 1.6 time percent of the time is it hit 83, and then it drops down below then. So based on that, Ernie sets some fences. So if this this reaches over 83, meaning 83% of stocks on the market are above their 20-day moving average, it's going to be a bearish indicator because it very seldom continues above that. So this one would appear as bearish because it's likely to revert back. And if stocks are going reverting now and going below their 20-day moving average is because they're falling in price. At the same time, if the, this ratio of stocks over their SMA 20 drops below 20%, it very infrequently stays there or drops below there that often, so that would be our bullish indicator. Right? And so when we see these different levels hit, you know, these will change. Right now we just have two bearish, 10 neutral, and one bullish, so it's still bullish. But recently in the past, there we go. 928, 929, back on 923 and 924, we started hitting light buys and bullish buy scenarios, okay? So when we hit the light buy, it was still hovering around 1930, it had been declining, and then the bullish buy at 1881, and SPX hasn't dropped there. In fact, it almost went up back to 1987, almost went back to 2000, and it did go back to 2000 here. So two things I use it for. One, when I see bullish buy, I might start buying some calls or puts at that time, knowing in the next maybe 10 to 15 days I might see a pop in the stock or a change or reversal in the trend that we've been seeing. On the positions that I own, I may look to manage that at that time, and if I have any bearish positions, a bear call credit spread, and I see a bullish buy, I might try to close it at that point before it starts moving against me. So I use the market sentiment tool for both management and for entering new positions, but we don't have any seasonal stock. Uh, Jim saw some of the historical tools that we had available. He wanted to know, does the platform have historical intraday stock and option prices? No, we just record the end of the day uh, data for the stock and for the options. We don't show the intraday movements. Um, another question came in, are there searches for non-directional spreads on SPX, say butterfly, iron condor? Yes. Not SPX directly, but it's very easy to set those up. So let me go into, um, I'll just add very quickly Iron Butterfly and Iron Condor. Okay, now I personally remember I said I don't trade Iron Butterflies, and I'll describe why in a second. But if you go into the Iron Condor, if you go into the search field for Iron Condors, just as we saw before, you've got some initial values, and you've got a default search you can use as a stepping stone for weekly Iron Condor positions as well to help get you started. If you go into sample searches, there's a default search here for index and ETF iron condors. And we see things uh, dominated by the Russell and so forth, but we can tweak this criteria to match what we want to see. In fact, what you can do, Jim, is create your own search. And you can put in the criteria you'd want for the time frame for the options, as we saw before, minimum net credit for the iron condor. Let me go back here. The maximum risk or the strike price difference, so if you only want to do 10-point spreads, I could put that in as well for my maximum risk. Your range out of the money and not only the probability between, the theoretical probability the stock would be trading between your short put and your short call strike price, but also a theoretical probability that the stock would be above the short put break even or above the short put strike price. You can use those four or five probabilities hand in hand to narrow down your results. Once you do that, you can go into the fundamentals tab in any search, and I can say, well, I saw these search results, and all I see is um, 
SPY, RUT, IBB, I don't see any SPX. But I can force the system here in the Fundamentals tab under the Search Symbol field, Search by Symbol for SPX. I'll just type that into my field. Now let's hit Submit. Okay, so no SPX spreads match my criteria. Right now, if it's 0 to 45 days out, 50 cent net credit, having the probability and same margin on both sides of the spread, some volume and open interest. But I bet you if I scale down my range out of the money, leave the probability where it is. Let me take this out of the money range out. In my strike difference at 10 should be okay. Cent return of 1, 0 to 45 days out. And now we're going to have volume and open interest. Let's see if the range out of the money. There you go. So there were no spreads that were 5% out of the money for the short put and the short call on SPX that offered at least a 50 cent net credit and a 65% probability between, all right, and a 10 point spread. We had to drop the out of the money range down to 3% in order to find those. So in the search, you can easily create a basic filter screen for what criteria you'd want to use, but then just search by symbol, okay, as well. All right. Oh, someone uh, someone just came in and asked, is there a webinar on the market sentiment tool? Yes. The market sentiment tool, in addition to being on the home tab, so I go back to the main home tab, it's one of the pods that I have selected as well as my watch list for the stocks that I'm currently trading right now or tracking, uh, the basic market activity. Other data you can ask is stocks in new 52-week highs or lows, um, top industry gainers or losers, dividends announced today, and so forth. But if I go back where I clicked on View Indicator Details to see the information, there's a help videos listed here. I click on help video, and here's about a 20-minute segment from a presentation that we did similar to this one where we walk through the market sentiment tool, how we use it, what the indicators are looking at, and so forth. So instead of the webinar one, there's the help videos right here. But, but you can also see the same presentation if you go to free webinars again to the archive webinars page. None of the Power Options Tools, the Market Sentiment Tool. When we click on that, I'm sorry, hit play. It's the same 19-minute video, <laughs> okay? So you can access it in two places. If you go into that details under the Market Sentiment Tool itself or under the Webinars page and Power Options Tools for the Market Sentiment Tool, you'll be able to see that also to access that as well. Okay, uh, so Bill, I hope I answered your questions regarding the credit spreads there and when I would close them. Again, if I have a credit spread that's reached 80 to 90% of its full profit and I still have 7 to 10 days to go, I'll probably look to close that position early. Um, um, regarding the, the criteria, okay, of when what I'd use for a bullish position, here, here's, here's something else to think about. There's, there's two things I wanted to mention here. Here's something else you want to think about. The, comment, the question did come in earlier about what criteria should I use to look for uh, positions, spreads, or naked puts. Uh, and then we had another one ask a similar question, and that's great. You're all asking the right questions. We just don't have the time to go in depth, so I try to point you towards the webinars we have that cover that in depth for you. Whether you're doing a long call, a bull put credit spread that's out of the money and has a high probability, a naked put that's out of the money and has a high probability, a standard collar that's at the money, a calendar call spread where you're looking for a neutral to a more mild performance or things of that nature, a covered call position. Essentially, any bullish position, whether it's leveraged or not, you're going to want to use the same stock criteria you would if you were going to buy a stock outright. Okay, because that's what you're doing. You're looking for a stock that you feel is going to be stable or move up in price, whether it's a bull put credit, bull call debit, covered call, naked put, calendar call spread, standard collar, uh, and so forth. Now, if I'm looking at a married put, a radioactive trade, or a long call position, I might be looking for criteria that have a better earnings per share growth, maybe 10% or more year from last year to this year, that are showing strong growth. Maybe you have a good uh, have been above their MACD an extended period, for example, or just crossed over looking for a breakout and so forth. And I'm looking at that because I need to see quicker growth in a shorter period where the others are neutral to bullish. But any neutral to bullish strategy, you're essentially looking at the same criteria as you would that you buy a stock. 
and, and the comment that came in, I believe it was from Scott, that said, which criteria would you use? Because it seems to me to be the most profitable. I have to look for, um, you know, the stock trending position. Well, and that's right. If I'm entering a bullish trade, I need to be in a bullish stock, or at least a stock that's reflecting some bullish criteria. And if I'm doing a bear call credit spread, a bear put debit spread, or anything along those lines, then yeah, I want to look for a stock that's trading in a downtrend, has weaker volume, and maybe has weak earnings as well. Uh, John quickly asked, are, are diagonal spreads available? Absolutely. Calendars. All right. If you don't see a strategy you want, we go into that other strategies tab. You can customize it. Calendar call and calendar put. In both the calendar call and the calendar put, you can see diagonal spreads or horizontals, either the same strike spreads or the diagonals. Now, when I say diagonals, I mean what I think is of a diagonal is where I'm buying an in-the-money call that's further out in time and selling near-term calls against it. Okay, we don't show reverse diagonals. In other words, see cores here is at 42.59. I might consider selling the 45 call near term and buying a 40 or 37 and a half call two, three, four months out in time. We don't show the reverse here, where I'd uh, sell the 50 and buy the 55 or 60, the higher strike put deeper out of the money put further out in time, the reverse diagonal. Uh, we don't like those positions, so we don't show them. So this is more of buying an in the money call and selling at or out of the money against it. You have default searches such as initial values, calendar leaps number one, uh, debits under 20 points, and then if you wanted to look at horizontals, you have the link here for same strike spreads. When I traded uh, calendar spreads, I never traded the horizontals. The reason why, we take a look at the profit and loss chart, doesn't even matter what the position is. Now that one's not too bad. I'm okay with this one, it looks all right. But most horizontal spreads, the same strike, sp oh, that's not even a horizontal. That's why it's not as steep. Here we go, like EAR at 70 and 70. Let's take a look at that chart. There we go. And this is still pretty good too, not a bad upper and lower break even for the first month of trade. But in general, these tr this one isn't as good, but this trade is harder to find, um, wider range is harder to find. That's actually one I might trade. But wh where I was going earlier, we were asked about the iron butterflies and the iron condors, are they available? Yes, they are. Here's why I don't trade iron butterflies. I am not, all this discussion we've had about what I use for bullish and bearish criteria and so forth, <laughs> and what I use in my search screens, I'm still not talented enough to be able to tell you that I can sit here and in the next 14 or 20 or 15 days, pick a stock that's going to be trading right at a particular strike price, in this case for eBay at 2250. Okay, I don't have that skill. If you have that skill where you can consistently pick stocks that are going to be trading right at or within one and a half or maybe 2% of a particular strike price over the next 15, 20 to 30 to 45 days, you just need my help in maybe setting up the criteria, but you don't need my help at all for stock selection or anything along those lines. Because if you can pick that consistently 80 to 90% of the time, you're much richer than I am and you're having much more profitable trades than I am. That's why I don't trade iron butterflies because I cannot pick a strike price that well. I pick more of a direction also. All right. Uh, John F. asked a question, what is the trade-off between a credit spread and a debit spread? Great question. I'm going to use one of our spread chain tools to illustrate that. So for in the spread chain tool, what this does is it allows you to compare positions, um, credit spreads against one another, debit spreads. So here in the spread chain, and it just came up as QQQ as a default, but I'm looking at the bear call spreads here on the left and the bull put spreads on the right that have to have a spread width of 5, minimum credit of 50 cents, 1% out of the money, and at least greater than 70% probability. Okay, now we also show you the put credit and call debit parity. Let me change stocks again and let's use SPX for example. I'm going to use October 16th expiration and we're going to look for a spread width of 10, minimum net credit of 50 cents using the midpoint, out of the money range one, good minimum return one, probability, let's lap that down to 70. Let's see what we get. Okay, let me put it back up to 75 to lower the results. <laughs> I didn't think I'd get any at 75, there we go. Okay, so what we're seeing here is that um, SPX is currently at uh, 2014, I mean 2014. Let me just show, oh yes, right here, 2014, remember that. So, if I was gonna do a bull put credit spread, John, 
I may sell the 1955 put and buy the 1945. Let's just take this top one here. It's going to have a low premium, but that's okay. So there's my 1955, and I'm buying the 1945. Now, with the midpoint pricing on the credit spread, I could sell the 1955 for 210 and buy the 45 for 132. This is going to give me a 78 cent spread. And remember, we had a 10 point risk. It's going to drop down to 922. So I'm looking to make 8.5%. If the stock stays above 1955, both puts expire worthless. We keep the 78 cents. We've got that 8.5% return. If the stock drops below 1945, we've got the 10 point loss, which would come out to 922 because we keep the 78 cents. Now, what is the difference? In a bull call debit spread, I'm selling an in the money 1955 and buying a deeper in the money 1945 for a debit. They're parity trades of one another. If you use the same strikes and the same expiration, you have the same risk reward profile. But pricing might be subtly different. In this case, we see that it would cost me 7125 to buy the 1945 in the money call compared to the 1945 out of the money put I would buy and we could sell the 1955 at 6175 this would put me at a debit at 950 so now if the stock stays above 1955 we'll close both legs get the $10 back and we'd make a 50 cent net credit or 50 cent total profit over an investment of 950 which only comes out to a 5.3% return. But the same risk reward profile, if the stock stays above 1955, we close out the debit spread and get the maximum profit. Stock falls below 1945, we have the maximum loss on the position. Same for both with the same strikes, they're parity trades of one another. In this case, the maximum return on the credit spread is 78 cents versus 50 cents for the debit spread, so we would go all day long with the credit spread. But there's, and this one doesn't really offer a variance, okay? But I use this tool to compare the parity because sometimes you might see if you can't get midpoints on the debit spread, it'll be much higher. Let me look real quick. Let's change this to a five point spread and keep the same numbers, but let's use a stock, okay? So we're going to look at bull put and call debit parity and there's one more important distinction that I haven't mentioned yet other than the obvious and one we pay a debit when we get a credit um, 25 cents let's do 25 cents on Starbucks five point spread range out of the money one minimum return for come on give me something let's try 70 probability 15 cents not credit that can't be it there's got to be five point spreads all right, let's do 2.5. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we narrowed one down. Starbucks right now at 60.70. We could sell the 58 and a half put or sell the in the money 58 and a half call and buy the 56. It's a two and a half point spread. Now, I'm not saying that this is possible, but based on the midpoint, we would get a 16 cent net credit on the bull put. I would sell this for 22. We'd buy this at six, we get 16 cents, so we'd get a 6.8% return for seven days, provided that Starbucks remains above 58.50. Now, interestingly enough, the midpoint prices for the 58 and a half call and the 56 call for next week are 385 by 178. So my debit would be 207, but this is a 2.50 spread. So if the stock stays above 58.50, I can buy to close my 58.50 call, sell to close my 56, get close to 250 back, or just leave it open, let my broker close it out, get the 250 back, so I'd have a maximum profit of 43 cents for the debit spread if I could get filled at the midpoints, okay, 43 cents over 250 investment, or actually 207 really, the 207 investment, versus a 16 cent profit for the bull put, on a 234 investment. Well, it's clear to me, in this case, if we can get filled at these midpoint prices, we're doing the debit spread all day long. Even though we were looking for a credit spread, we'd end up doing the debit spread. The other issue with the debit spread is you have to actively close it to realize the profit. That might require two commissions from your broker or just one, depending on how they translate buying the stock and selling the stock as well. So you have to pay an extra full commission. You may get charged a small fee, 
then the bull put, if you let the position expire, are worthless. Okay, but you have to actively trade those the debit spreads in order to close them as well. All right, so that's the difference. And in addition to that, John, if I go back now to I apologize here. Let's go back to the free webinars page. A lot of presentations discuss this here. If you want some more detailed information on using that spread chain tool for parity, it'll be discussed. Oh, sorry, folks. It'll be discussed here in the um, what is a vertical spread and the hands-on look. But better than that, I think in the requested topics, I think in this one on credit spreads, we discuss it. Oh, I know there was one I had recently. Pull foot management. There's one in here I thought where I discussed parity trades, and it's either the one from 928 or um, this one here. Searching for bull put credit spreads, trade webinars, option strategies. Give it, hmm. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. It is this one. 928, 2015. John, I apologize. Using the portfolio to evaluate roles, but evaluating parity trades such as bear call credit versus bear put debit bear call spreads on ETFs and so forth. So this one here from 928, that's gonna go more in depth that spread chain tool and applying the parity adjustments as well. Okay, all right. Oh, and, and uh, Jim said that he does broken wing butterflies. Unfortunately, I just have the iron butterfly available as a strategy. I don't have broken wing butterflies. All right, well, I don't see any more questions coming in, ladies and gentlemen. We are at uh, 5.41 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, basically, real quick, I just want to remind everyone, of course, if you're currently on your 14-day free trial, at the end of your 14-day free trial are different levels of service. We do offer a 20-minute delayed service. You'll have access to all of the search tools and the different strategies, all of the analysis plus the portfolio tool with 20-minute delayed quotes, and that's $60 per month. Um, we do offer a real-time service as well, which is $100 per month. The real-time service, every time you refresh the page or run a search, you're getting the numbers and calculations at that very instant. Now, on those two levels of service, you can upgrade to the historical tools. We saw some of that earlier when I went to the historical chain, but there's also a historical search where you can run your criteria historically over time to see how your results would have performed in one of the given strategies. Our data goes back to 2006. Um, and it's just $40 more. So for the 20 minute delayed plus the historical would be $100 per month and the real time plus historical would be $140 per month as well. Right now we are also offering an end of day service and the end of day service um, is $40 per month. So you only get an update once a day. Uh, John, if you're on your trial right now, you have access to the 20 minute delayed service and you have access to just what we saw in my trial account which is what we were using today, you can go back about three months or so, three and a half months with the historical tools there uh, to see different um, views, okay? So you can go back in time to look at chains historically about three to four months, but if you subscribe to one of the historical services, add that package onto your subscription for the additional $40, well then, um, I apologize, uh, you'll have data back to 2006, okay? So that's what the historical tools. And as always, um, not to sound like a broken, rec broken record tonight, but in that webinars page, one of the Power Options Tools webinars is the historical suite of tools. We did that just a couple weeks ago, so that'll give you some information and details on how to use the historical tools. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, I wanna thank you for joining me this afternoon. This evening, I should say, as we move on into the night here, Friday night. Um, if you think of any other questions later on, just contact us at any time. You can send us an email to support at powerop.com. Remember, you can also call us during market hours at 302-992-7971. There's also contact links on the bottom of every Power Options page.